Please come to the mic. There's a mic here. There's also a mic there. There you go. Um, so, can you tell me where you're from? So just give us your name and the university or college that you're from. My name is Liam, and I'm just from Mount Allison University. I was curious after the speech about what thoughts you might have on the future of the sort of Aboriginal Reserve model in general as, as a small, sort of rural, isolated community. Certainly in Canada and most developed countries, we've seen a decline of non Aboriginal rural communities to either very small populations or disappearance unless it's sustained by a mine or some other major natural resource development project. So I'm, well, we're talking about Aboriginal communities and reserve communities that are generally very small, isolated, whatnot. What is sort of successful model we can expect or hope for, whereby Aboriginal communities can continue in their existence as being these small rural communities when that isn't necessarily always been what we've seen being successful with communities in general? Um. You know, I'm going to uh, answer that perhaps not in the way you expected because I don't consider it my appropriate role to suggest what their community should look like. It's for Aboriginal people to tell us what they want for their communities. And frankly, um, <clears throat> you know, Paul Martin, who spoke here last year, uh, set out what he called the Kelowna Accord. Uh, which was a huge amount of money, $5.1 billion over a few years. But what was most important about the Kelowna Accord was that the discussion of Aboriginal life was done in respectful, respectful conversation with Aboriginal leaders and Aboriginal communities across Canada before the Kelowna Accord was put in place. And the, and the Aboriginal Métis and Inuit communities, they had very strong sense of what they wanted. Their land claims, their land rights, their resource entitlement, their health and education and welfare, the nature of their governance. And somehow, through an 18-month period of discussion, they came to a conclusion of what it might look like on Aboriginal terms. And what it might look like was the preservation of a number of those outlying and distinct communities by providing them with the kind of services that we provide non-Aboriginal communities in some parts of, in some remote parts of this, uh, of this country. So my, my feeling is that we should try to reinstitute the process that this government completely trampled on and jettisoned. It was a good process. It actually got everybody to the table talking, and they were very excited about signing the Kelowna Accord, and then it all fell apart because the government changed. But the, the terms were dictated by Aboriginal communities. And so I liked about Martin when he sat down with them. He said, I'm not here to tell you what I think should happen. I'm here to listen. And to be fair to him, he listened. Anyone else? Please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Stephen Lewis. My name is Henry, and I'm a high school student from Toronto. Um, I think I've heard that you went to Rwanda before, and I think that um, after Rwanda, the world vowed never to let that happen again. And in 2005, again, um, the world through the World Outcome Document um, said that we're prepared to take military action. You know, if there's genocide or things like that occurring, if that starts to happen with ISIS in Iraq, do you think that we should be taking a more bold stance? You know, to prevent genocide and things like that. Oh boy, I, I, there, there, is, there is something called a principle, I think that's what you're referring to, largely agreed upon in 2005, called the responsibility to protect. They, they reduce it to R2P, responsibility to protect. And in fact, Canada was uh, very, very involved in creating that uh, discussion. Uh, Canadian Foreign Minister Lloyd Axworthy and, uh, and the present uh, president of um, Ottawa University, who was then the Canadian ambassador, Alan Brock, they were very deeply involved in working on the responsibility to protect. And they effectively said that in the case of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, uh, ethnic uh, extermination, that countries in the world had the responsibility to intervene, that we should not allow national borders to prevent intervention. That this is the one instance where we have a responsibility to protect if things are going haywire and human rights and, and human beings are being destroyed. 
Um, the responsibility to protect has been talked about for use in Libya, it was used in Libya as a rationale, it's been used in, um, in uh, the Central African Republic and in, uh, and in Mali as a rationale, uh, but it's being used very tentatively and very carefully because uh, moving into another country on the grounds of responsibility to protect is a very careful thing to do. Um, particularly when, for example, in a place like Syria, you have the Security Council divided, you would never get an agreement. That's your problem. When, when Russia, the United States, China have a veto, you can't get an agreement to use the principle of responsibility to protect because someone always has an interest in the country that is under the microscope. But we, there was a collective interest in Libya, there was a collective interest in the Central African Republic, and, and it was used. Um, I'm not sure how often it was used. Do I think it should be used? Yeah, yeah. If you can get international agreement and you have real grounds uh, to identify genocide, then, then the world has responsibility. I mean, James was in Rwanda, I wasn't. I looked at Rwanda after the event. But what we heard today at the conference was the extraordinary horror of what was happening on site, what was going on in the country. That required intervention, and it did not happen. And it did not happen because the world betrayed General Romeo Dallaire, a Canadian general who asked for troops in an effort to prevent the genocide. If I could just yeah, I was going to say something, something that Stephen has said. Um, the use of responsibility to protect, in my opinion, should only be based on a United Nations uh, Security Council resolution. It should not depend on a so-called coalition of the willing internationally. Uh, should it depend on a so-called coalition of the willing, it allows for the, politi the politicization of a humanitarian intent. In fact, just to maybe fill out some of the story on the responsibility to protect, uh, uh, Lloyd Axworthy held in a small meeting uh, with a number of people, uh, myself included, um, about the formulation of responsibility to protect. And during that meeting, I actually objected uh, not to the idea, not to the concept of the responsibility to protect, but I objected deeply and vociferously uh, with the use of the word humanitarian, uh, that this basically politicizes humanitarian action uh, and leaves it open to political manipulation. And I suggested very strongly to them that they uh, have a convention or an agreement or a, 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 a treaty or a, a body or an agreement of law uh, that was specific to genocide, that was specific to human rights violations, and that was specific to war crimes, uh, and that they could call such interventions a genocide intervention, a war crimes intervention, a human rights violation, a violations uh, intervention. Sadly, that was rejected, and it was rejected because it was felt that uh, that wouldn't fly uh, politically, uh, and that it would diminish the, the public appeal uh, of uh, the concept of responsibility to protect. And we've seen, subsequently, the political manipulation and the wrongful use of uh, responsibility to protect, uh, in particularly in, uh, in Libya. Uh, so it's a very careful uh, and important distinction uh, that really gets to the heart of international relations. And I think it also is an important and careful distinction that not only deals with contemporary issues in international relations, but also sets the stage for our future. So the way in which we approach these issues um, uh, it really requires deep thought, deep wisdom, uh, and, and, and uh, deep uh, political awareness uh, in terms of their current and future implications. It's a good question, though. Uh, thank you for asking. It's, it's not, an easy, not an easy issue, because when you have vetoes at the Security Council, it's very difficult to get even approval for, for anything. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Harold, and I'm from Vancouver, BC, also a high, high school student um, participating in Guardians of Confederation. Um, I was just wondering, what is your opinion on the role of Canada as a, peace, as a peacekeeping nation, uh, and the government spending on the military, considering we are still a country in debt? In debt? Yes. Was the word? Uh, well, 
when I was at the UN, it's so interesting what's happened. When I was at the UN, I used to be called in every second week by the Secretary General to say, we need troops. Uh, we were one of the main troop contributors. We were so reliable. We would always come forward and be willing to provide troops for one crisis point or another. And it has so completely declined that when I went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo just, uh, just a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, three or four years ago now, um, uh, I remember that there were a total of two or three Canadians in a United Nations contingent of 20,000. Uh, and they were doing communications rather than traditional peacekeeping. So our role as a peacekeeping country, providing United Nations blue berets or providing police forces or providing even administrative and logistical support, it has declined dramatically. We're simply not in that category. The peacekeepers are now coming from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Uruguay, a number of Latin American countries, uh, Rwanda. Not, and Rwanda, yes, Rwanda. And, and South Africa. Yeah, African countries pulling in, but the role we once had is gone. We're now more comfortable dealing with military interventions because that's a that's an idea that this government has. They, they, they like that. They think it's nationalistic and patriotic and what we should be doing. And it's, um, from, for people like myself, I think we've lost a lot by relinquishing the peacekeeping dimension. That was a tremendous role for Canada. And the world honored it and treasured it. And we've thrown it away. You know, it was Lester B. Pearson, uh, a Canadian uh, who then as foreign minister in 1956, I believe, yeah. initiated the very concept of peacekeeping. Uh, in fact, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for having done so. He then went on to become uh, the prime minister of this country. Now, our role as a peacekeeping nation um, is ancient history, frankly, as Stephen has very clearly described. The fact is, we are not a peacekeeping nation anymore. We have virtually no capacity to do so. We have virtually no political will under the current political leadership to do so. That does not mean that we cannot once again be a powerful and deeply significant peacekeeping nation. In fact, I would argue that it is very much in our material and our security interests to pursue that as a primary goal of our uh, foreign policy. And I would also very much add that that is not up to any government. It's up to you. It's up to you. You, as citizens, have to engage not only government, but other citizens to create an awareness and to create a demand for that kind of uh, foreign policy. And I, I, I can tell you from my own experience over, over many, many years that what you do as a citizen, Stephen alluded to this beautifully in his uh, comments this afternoon, on the power of civil society. What you do as citizens, what you associate around, how you come together around ideas, how you pursue certain ideas, that is the force that defines our national destiny. And I encourage you to take that responsibility. It is your responsibility. Uh, and that is what will drive the foreign policy in Canada. You had a peacekeeping college in Prince Edward Island. And it's closed. I can remember that uh, I, I had a military attaché when I was the ambassador for Canada at the United Nations. I had a military attaché, I'm not sure why, but I did. And, and his name was Lieutenant Colonel Alex Morrison, and he became the first head of the peacekeeping college here in Prince Edward Island. And they closed it down because, as Jamie said, we we're out of the business. But he's also right in saying we don't have to be out of the business forever. So we turn it over to you. Uh, my name is Jared Henry, and I'm um, from New Brunswick with the uh, Guardians of Confederation. And I was just uh, uh, wondering, would you, and I mean no disrespect, but would you rather that we let ISIS attack the Kurds than intervene? I don't think that's the choice, frankly. I mean, ISIS is a, is a dreadful organization and it has to be dealt with by the countries in the region. 
and for Canada, the United States, and others to spend their time bombing ISIS with futility. This is all they stopped attacking the Kurds. It's just, it's just that we have decided, like Vietnam, we have decided once again to intervene in a foreign war which cannot be won, which will cost tremendous numbers of lives, and which is ultimately an expression of imperialism rather than an expression of intelligent intervention. And, and that's you've got you to make those choices. Are there other things to do? ISIS is the most sort of dreadful, one of the most dreadful forces on the planet, but you can't, you can't do absolutely everything. You've got to make some choices. I, one of the things that has bewildered me, why is no one doing anything about Boko Haram in Nigeria? Here's an organization which abducted over 200 girls. Here's an organization which killed 45 young students in a school just 10 days ago. Here's an organization that is destroying the northern part of Nigeria, and the Nigerian military says they can't do anything about it. Boko Haram is as ruthless and extreme as ISIS in its own way, Boko Haram in Western Nigeria. Now, what I, don't, what I don't get is, we can send, we, we can bomb individual vehicles, individual vehicles and almost individuals from God knows how far away, but we can't seem to find a way of dealing with Boko Haram in, in northern Nigeria. You're just picking your battles for your own interests and what will serve your interests. And I, I'm, I'm just uh, weary of that. When I, was, when I was leaving the UN in 1988, I was called into the offices of the American ambassador to the United Nations. They wanted to show me satellite images of the Russians leaving Afghanistan. It's 1988. I was absolutely stunned. You could make out individuals leaving the tents and moving across the Afghani deserts. It, it was, un, I couldn't believe that you couldn't see the exact facial features, but the satellites could identify individual human beings from tens of thousands of miles away, millions of miles away. And, and we cannot, you know, and all these years later, we're not able to deal with some of these explosions in various places. So I, I, I actually think that that there really comes a moment in time when the regions involved have to deal with these guys and that and the United States shouldn't be deciding to be the policeman for the world. I don't want to hog the mic, but... Uh, no, no, you go ahead. I see your concern. Uh, yeah, uh, just, so would you rather us intervene, Bo Boko Haram, or well, do so you, like, just... Uh, sorry? Go ahead. Did I, did I no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, like, I understand. I was opposed to the war in Libya. Um, I tend to take a non-intervention, intervention, <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, stance. But um, I feel like taking back the, giving air support to take back the Demon uh, Mosul was, or Mosul, uh, was uh, quite an achievement that was important. Like. Waiting for the UN to get around to it might not have worked out quite so well for the people of that city. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that these interventions are, are they're, they're bloody and they're terrible and they're not working. And there may be another role for Canada. Canada has to, I mean, we, we are a country of limited capacity and resources and we should use what we have more thoughtfully and carefully and not be swept into a militaristic concept because the United States says that's what they want. Remember, this is a U.S.-directed foreign policy. This basically has nothing to do with Canada. So, could you just elaborate on what you would have done, sir? I, I would have done a lot more humanitarian work in the whole region, and over a number of years, rather than to see it fall apart. Okay, thank you. And what I, uh, I'll just like to follow up on that. You know, the, the, um, the Middle East is, is uh, uh, Water. And it's not without cause. Right? It didn't just happen. Yeah. Uh, the, the most uh, proximate uh, intervention uh, that uh, was deeply causal in the current quagmire uh, was the American invasion, illegal and unjust, by the way, uh, of Iraq. And it was an invasion. Uh, that was predicated on these naive Pollyannish notions of building democracy, uh, and never mind uh, the, the fatuous arguments around weapons of mass destruction and so on. Uh, but the, the idea, the naive idea of building democracy 
and state building uh, was the uh, one of the, 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 the assumptions uh, that predicated uh, the intervention or the, 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 uh, the occupation in war. Had that assumption been properly resourced with appropriate political analysis, uh, with something more than uh, serial box slogans, uh, but a deep and proper and thorough and respectful political analysis, and then a deep and proper and thorough, respectful pol and properly resourced political process, there may well have been a very different outcome, however illegal and unjust the, the original intervention. That very same absence, that absence of awareness and of, of, of uh, uh, commitment uh, to the political dimensions uh, of conflict and to the political dimensions between nations uh, in the current Middle East uh, quagmire uh, is fueling that quagmire. Now, the, 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 the final sort of point I'd like to make is that he who writes the, uh, he who writes the menu is actually the master. There's no choices. You think you have choices when you sit going to a restaurant and you, oh, I'll have, you know, so I'll have spaghetti or I'll have a pizza. That is a limited exercise of choice. What we're seeing now in terms of how the framing of uh, the Middle East uh, is being presented is a limited range of choices. The only choices that we, that we see put before us are military choices. Now, there is absolutely no question in my mind uh, that ISIL, is an, is an extreme, is a barbaric, is a brutal uh, uh, military force that must be stopped. There is no question about that. The question is, how? And then the question is, what is the surrounding process around that? What is the process that gave rise to ISIL? That must be addressed. Now, that is a place where Canada could be playing a significant or could have, as could have, could have, not now, but could have. And it also, in addition, Canada uh, could have and still can play a very significant role in terms of humanitarian relief and appropriate, independent, impartial, and neutral humanitarian relief for the, for the millions of civilians that are suffering indescribably across the Middle East. In Syria alone, there are 9 million internally displaced people. The population is 24 million. There are 3 million people who are refugees outside of the borders of Syria. It is an absolute catastrophic situation by any description. And those people are suffering terribly. And where are we? What are we doing for them? We are offering them crumbs. And our, our policy on, on, on uh, the, the, the hundreds of thousands, 130,000 eligible Syrian refugees, our policy is obscene. We have accepted a pittance, a few hundred, and it's absolutely obscene. So there's so much more that we could be doing, but I would encourage you and others to really think more broadly about causality and to, 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 to not get trapped uh, into the defined <coughs> menu of options that are uh, so easily presented to us. Uh, by our by by our political apparent masters. Thank you. First, you invade Iraq and create chaos. Libya to create chaos, and then when it's all falling apart, you decide you have to bomb them again in order to compensate for the chaos you created. I'm very cynical about it. Yes, you are. So uh, it's going to be okay first. Uh, my name is Ian. I'm from Dal. Uh, my question is for both of you. Uh, it's pretty clear that both of you have been around a lot of you know, death, violence, sickness, things like that, that many of us here probably can't imagine. Uh, this is a more personal question. How both of you do you deal with uh, being around that personally, emotionally, uh, just being around that, what seems like a big part of your life? Well, uh, actually, we've both written about it, uh, come to think of it. <laughs> uh, it just, just suddenly occurred to me. Uh, but um, I didn't deal with it terribly well. I, I felt, uh, I'm not sure to this day I deal with it terribly well. Um, I, I, I think I got uh, progressively more and more overwhelmed, and I, I guess the way I dealt with it was anger. I started lashing out at the circumstances. You identify, of course, with the people who are under the gun, but I, I, um, I just felt that something had to be done to limit the carnage, and, and, uh, and while it was emotionally enervating and exhausting and upsetting. 
uh, I guess I overcame it uh, by fighting back. Uh, it's also, I think it's also important to know, and again, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure James would agree, the extraordinary courage and resilience of the people on the ground, the generosity of spirit in the face of the worst that the world brings to them, is, is quite powerful. It's, uh, it, 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 it keeps you going, it makes you feel, by God, if these people under siege can handle things with such remarkable human decency in the face of horror, then what am I quibbling about? What right have I to be uh, inappropriately emotional about it? So you just fight back. I love fighting back. I hate, I hate capitulating. I grow more aggressive with every passing day. There was a time when I just wanted to persuade people gently through the linguistic arts. Now I'd like to throttle the bastards. Every <laughs> single every, every, every one of them. I guess that's the way I, I, I deal with it. I have, a, I, I, I have an enemies, li enemies list that is so long, you can't, you can't, it never ends. And I'd like to cross it off one day after the other. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's just my own opinion. You're better at this than I am. Well, I, you know, I'm actually not much better at it, Stephen, than you are. Um, I think, you know, I think that I would say a couple of things. One is that I emphasize with my comments about Stephen. You know, humility is, is really a powerful thing. It allows you to see others in their fullness. It allows you to, to see to, to, to the extent that it's humanly possible between two people. It allows you to, to at least have some uh, uh, sense, some literal physical sense of the being and the, the, the physicality and the suffering of, of, of that other person. And that requires humility. But it also, it's a great gift. Because on the one hand, you are, you, 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 you are obliterated. And, and I have been obliterated emotionally and, and, and existentially by much of my experience in the world. I've been completely laid flat by, by, by that experience. But what it does is it shows you that you have enormous power because you are suddenly free of all of the constraints. And this is, this is Stephen's rage. This is his, his drive. And I have the same, but I have a slightly different way of, of doing it. And it may be that I'm 25 or so, I think, whatever, years younger than you, and I may end up in 35 years. 30, I may end up 45. In, the, in the same boat as me. But, but, but humility, it gives you freedom, and it gives you power. It gives you the power to do, to be, and to act, and to engage. And it also gives you the power to change what you hope for. Now that, I think, is a key. You realize, one realizes that, that one's previous hopes and aspirations are Pollyannish. They're naive, I refer to, they're naive, utopian dreams. You, but it's not that you don't dream. It's not that you don't hope, but you change what you hope for. You, you hope for others to also engage and also to take their political responsibility as citizens. And, I, I, and that, I think, is probably the single most important principle uh, that I hope you walk out of here with today. That you are responsible for your polity, for your community, for the, for the expression of values and practice and, and whatever of your community. Uh, no, I have a question actually about China. And oh. China's recent like, um, increase in foreign aid, especially in Africa, and as we all know, uh, China's human rights record is the most pristine. Um, and and when they, their allocation of foreign aid, especially for infrastructure projects, although that foreign aid is so needed, it doesn't really come with any strings attached or conditionality, like from the West, where they're, they're not, there must be some sort of recognition of human rights, and there, there's much more conditionality in that respect. So I was just wondering if you could both comment on on how that's making such a large change in, in international aid architecture, and also as China's a rising like as a rising, rising regional hegemon, and some some would argue that's competing with the United States at certain levels, and how that's going to and you're speaking of the United States um, being this world police force, and so how how in the future those two will mesh together and those two will compete, especially 
like in, in aid and in forwarding and how China is not willing to attach human right conditionality or any sort of that to its aid. Sure. Well, I think what you're, you're, you're identifying a number of, of, of uh, important elements uh, of uh, what is uh, a profound change now uh, in uh, the nature of the relationship uh, between states. Um, since the 2008 international financial crisis, um, the United States is no longer the single uh, hegemon, uh, global hegemon. Uh, the United States is now no longer uh, the, uh, uh, the hyper power, uh, as it was called uh, from roughly 1999 uh, through to 2008. The international financial crisis uh, has, has uh, in the context of emerging other powers, uh, has literally changed the power configuration in the world. We now live in a deeply multipolar world. And in my view, it's going to become even more multipolar uh, over the course of the next 15 or 20 uh, so years. Uh, we, uh, the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, are significant powers. Uh, and they are significant regional powers uh, to varying degrees. Uh, um, and that is the new architecture uh, within which uh, uh, international relations uh, will uh, occur. And that means then, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, traditional architectures of, of, of governance of the United Nations, for example, um, uh, uh, are um, uh, uh, in a situation where there is a lot of change. The G7, uh, once the G8, now the G7 plus one, now the G, G7 minus plus or minus one with Russia, uh, has now expanded really uh, to uh, the G20. G7 is certainly very important within the G20, uh, but the G20 uh, is really de facto um, the, uh, outside of the United Nations system, the, the new center, if you will, of global governance. Uh, and so within that context, we see changes like the rise of uh, China. There was in 2008 and 2009 um, by, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Niles Ferguson, the, the Oxford uh, theorist, uh, I think it's, what's his name? Uh, anyway, there, there was a very famous uh, Oxford theorist who, who posed uh, this, this new uh, name uh, for uh, the relationship between China and uh, the United States. Uh, the United, China holds the majority of the United States debt. Uh, the United States is the single largest purchaser of, of Chinese goods and services. And so China and the United States are now locked together uh, in this symbiotic relationship. Uh, and Niles Ferguson, I think it's Ferguson, uh, uh, proposed this new term, Chimerica, uh, as, the new, as the new power configuration. Uh, and now this, this, this concept was rejected by the Republicans in, in the United States uh, for all kinds of, I think, fairly obvious reasons if one is a Republican. But, the, but what, what this tells you is that the configuration of power uh, around the world uh, uh, is changing, uh, and changing very significantly. So issues like uh, what you now raise, the, the very real, it's not rising, it's present, power of China across, uh, and not just Africa, but across the developing world, uh, yeah, um, and its approach to foreign aid, its approach to human rights, its approach to uh, uh, to uh, development assistance and so on. These are really, really central issues. And in a multipolar world, and this is why I've gone on a little bit about the multipolar world, in a multipolar world, what is important is the counterbalance, right? So is the other perspective. Now, typically, uh, and since the end of, of World War II, the West has really defined uh, the language of international relations. And part of that language has been human rights. Part of that language has been social, cultural, and economic rights as part of the UN framework. That, unless it is properly asserted, unless it is properly endorsed uh, and, and resourced, then that counterbalance falls away. Uh, and then the, the other perspective reaches dominance. And so this is, this is the, 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 the context the new now global context. 
And so, in terms of dealing with Chinese perspective uh, on uh, foreign affairs and, and on uh, uh, human rights and so on, it's quite important that the West uh, and other powers like South Africa, Brazil, uh, 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 India, uh, uh, engage in a language uh, that supports the kind of, of perspective uh, that has been so central to the international system since uh, World War II. I don't know, Stephen, if you want uh, that, I think China is running roughshod over Africa. They're superseding every other aid deliverer. And they're supporting regimes which are truly offensive, like the Mugabe's regime in Zimbabwe. Mugabe is, a, is a, uh, an ambulatory egomaniac who is a murderer and a rapist. And he runs the country and he's 88 years old and he'll run it forever. He expects to live forever and he'll run it forever. And he is being sustained by Chinese money, billions of dollars. And there's no request for human rights on the part of China. Why would they request it? They are human rights violators themselves. They would never say to others, you've got to observe certain human rights prior proprieties in order to receive the money. The truth is around the world, in the multipolar world that, uh, that uh, James is talking about, is that trade will always trump aid. You will always be most interested in extracting the best terms of trade you can, and you therefore take that more seriously than your aid, and you don't worry about human rights considerations. You can be sure that when Prime Minister Harper is off to China uh, to, uh, to engage in a billion dollar deal, or when Kathleen Wynne of Ontario is off to China to engage in a billion dollar deal, they're not talking human rights. They may use the phrase once in a private session, but what they're interested in is the return on their investment. So we're in a very cynical, tough world because China is now the dominant power. I mean, the United States has more strength, but everybody knows where the world is heading. The world is heading towards hegemony of China. There's just, a, no, I don't think there's any question about that. A few years down the road, they'll all be bound to the Chinese imperative. And, and uh, how that works out, I mean, that is a very, very difficult situation. You, you, the, the frustration of the United Nations is that these BRIC countries and others, the Brazils, Argentina, Nigeria, South Africa, India, Pakistan, even Japan and Germany, they are in a rage that five other countries hold vetoes at the Security Council. That Russia and China and the United States and France and the UK hold a veto. France and the UK, they're relatively small economies compared to the others. And there's something called the European Union. Why do they have a veto? They, they are determined to crack the Security Council and every time they make a proposal, somebody vetoes it. Because it's not in their interest. So that the, the difficulty of transforming the multilateral system and of dealing with China is real. I mean, I'm glad you're looking at it because it's absolutely fascinating. And one never knows exactly where it's going to lead. Except they'll give money to anybody if, if it exerts control. You should see them do the little country of Lesotho with 2.3 million people. They've taken over all of the textile industry. I mean, they're everywhere. Every road that's built, every hospital that's built, every aqueduct that's built, Chinese money. It's something to witness. Where will it lead? Go ahead. Hi, my name's Stephen. I go to Mount Allison. And so, based on what you were just saying about China, do you think that uh, waiting for them to uh, withhold their veto on the Security Council before military intervention is problematic? Or do you think that how can we cope with that going forward? Well, you, they, you look at this fascinating agreement that has been reached between the United States and China on global warming. You know, uh, to be brutally frank about it, it's an encouraging political moment. The targets they've set are ridiculous. It's not going to make a significant difference to where the world is going on climate change. But it feels good because these two superpowers have finally got together on some subject and it gives the world some hope. Whether that will result in some future influence on China around a military intervention or foreign aid or trade, who knows? It's so difficult at this point to assess. I mean, I think, I think James has it right, that we're right in the throes of a moment. And you've got to take strong stands, but you don't know where it's going to lead. It's so difficult to predict. But in the future, if we were to think that a humanitarian military intervention would be necessary, should we have to convince the Chinese that it's in their interest to, to do so, to carry it out? 
Yes, yeah. If you want to have a military intervention in Tibet, they'd be very happy. Um, Hong Kong, they'd rejoice. Uh, I, I think the very important point that's been made here is that don't mix the humanitarian and the military. It kills the humanitarian every time. And we've got, we've got to separate the two. And, and uh, I'm not at all sure whether you'll ever be able to do anything and avoid a Chinese veto if it's in their sphere of influence. But it's 2014, who knows what will happen. You know, we're going to get a new president in 2016. Probably be Hillary, maybe somebody else. This Republican Congress, I mean, they are a bunch of lunatics. Uh, these, are, these, these Republican politicians are, uh, I, I mean, they are so limited in their, in their capacity and their views of the world. It's, it's terrifying, actually. And they're not even the Tea Party. They're the, you know, they're the middle of the road. Think of it was the Tea Party. We'd all be dead. So, so uh, I, I, I don't know where, I don't know where it's heading. I know what I, I would like. Presumably, what people in the room would like. I would like Canada's voice to be heard. I'd love it if we were publicly using international forums to talk thoughtfully about international peace and security, about humanitarian imperatives, about human rights. If we were seen as a country, a middle power that really had principle, instead nobody hears us. We say nothing. Uh, we offer six jets to drop bombs, but we say nothing. It's really sad. The other thing that Canada could be doing, another way of reframing that, is that we should be participating in uh, framing and discussing global, uh, global public goods. Yeah. Now, now, under that rubric, that includes climate change, includes uh, uh, infectious disease like Ebola, it, it includes global health, it includes, uh, the, the, I alluded to it very quickly, the, the food crisis, the fuel crisis, uh, and the governance crisis uh, that we face globally. And so one of the things that's kind of inherent in your question that, that begs for kind of illumination uh, is that you know, politics at the global level, geopolitics, uh, it's not, as Stephen has again emphasized, it's not about humanitarianism. It is about balance of power. And the nature of power changes constantly. There are many forms of power, economic power, military power, the power of ideas, power of, of science, many, many different forms of power. But that is what international relations uh, is about, balance of power. It is not about humanitarian issues. Now, when I talk about the idea of uh, uh, global uh, uh, public goods, that includes governance. So how do you create a system? How do you create an international system where balance of power considerations can be adjudicated, can be engaged in a non-violent way? Doesn't mean without conflict, but, but without violence. That's the question. That was the, that was, that was the United Nations project post-World War II. The question is, what is our project for the 21st century? If we didn't have the United Nations, we would have to invent it. So the question is, how do we reform what we have so that we don't degenerate, and we very easily could degenerate very quickly into a multipolar, high-conflict world? How do we do that? Now that is a role, that question, the pursuit of that question, Canada, is a role for our country. It's a role for you. It's a role for your passions, for your careful thinking, for your careful informed ideas, and for the application of mind, of time, of energy toward the conception of the good. And I think that is what we, uh, we, we can, and that is what we absolutely must do if we're to have a viable future. And there's a footnote to that which I know James agrees with. The fundamental problem of this world is it's a patriarchy. It's world run by men. And until you can approximate gender equality in this world, you're never going to get it anywhere. Because the, the, the tremendous diminution of the rights of women everywhere, on every front, is what causes the intellectual and political paralysis. And men run roughshod over all the decision making. And no matter how much you talk to them, no matter what you deal with, you can't change them. The Secretary General of the United Nations, 10 days ago, 
announced a 14-person panel to oversee a review of all of the United Nations peacekeeping operations. A 14-person panel, 11 men and three women. And he talks endlessly about gender equality. I mean, that guy is such a hypocrite, it's beyond belief. And he's Secretary General of the United Nations. And he did it on the day, on the anniversary date, of something called Resolution 1325, which is the resolution in the United Nations that says, on all matters of international peace and security, women should have an equal voice. And what is more peace and security than international peacekeeping? So he appoints a panel of 14, so he appointed out to him, and he apologizes. And does he do anything? Not a thing. Does he appoint a woman co-chair? Does he appoint additional women? Does he take some men off the panel and appoint women? Not a chance. And who's affected by peacekeeping around the world? Women and children. And who makes all the decisions? Men. You have to understand, as you're, as you're looking at the role for Canada, fighting this through, that the absence of gender equality prejudices absolutely every issue. And, and that, that, for many of us, is the key central notion of international reform. That's what has to change. Thank you very much. Why don't we, yeah, there's three questions. Let's hear the three questions yeah. and we can. Sure, sure, sure. I rather like the situation today in the big hall where you simply had somebody standing silently at a microphone. <laughs> that, that was delicious. I really, I really like that. Do you, do you intend to say something? Oh, what a pity. Okay. See you guys down there. Uh, my question was mainly towards the fact between uh, biofuels and uh, people starving all over the world. Uh, studies say that a proper methanol wedge that will cut down on uh, fuel use will uh, cost about one-sixth of the globe's uh, farmland, which would greatly reduce the uh, uh, food production in the world, which due to the fact of the spot that we're in right now, would really have a very positive uh, in outcome, as well as the fact that some people say that biodiesel has a negative uh, net loss, uh, how it costs fuel to make biodiesel with the farmland equipment. And I was just wondering about uh, your perspective on that and if we should maybe look past biodiesel and maybe something else so we can simply feed people because we can't, because there's either uh, you fuel a car or you feed a person. You can't really do both. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Piper and I'm a student at Mount Allison University and just to go back talking about um, gender inequality throughout the world. So similarly to your experience, the one you have described at the beginning of your lecture, I too was raised in an incredibly, wonderfully feminist household and it's my understanding that you've devoted a large portion of your life to combating injustices all over the world. Um, but what are the implications of currently being in a province um, where women don't have access to a legal medical procedure such as abortion um, in the same way as they do in other parts of Canada. Right, fair enough. Okay. We're going to take the last question, question and we'll, we'll, we'll ask them. We'll 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 yeah. Hi, my name is Jillian Turner. I'm a journal student over at Holland College. Um, you spoke in your lecture about the need for an inquiry into missing and murdered Aboriginal women. If this inquiry actually does happen, what would you like to see come of it, and what would you like to see happen? Um, why don't I run through that Please. quickly, and then you wind up. Um, around uh, biofuels, what we have learned is that the production of ethanol requires so much energy that ultimately you are discharging more carbon in the creation of an alternative fuel than you have benefits from the fuel itself. So the, the tremendous subsidization of using corn, for example, in the United States, or sugar, for example, in Brazil, to create uh, biofuels, that is now diminishing. The world has lost its enthusiasm for the biofuels as they realize that it runs counter to the efforts to deal with with carbon. Mm -hmm. Now there are huge numbers of questions about renewables and for instance nuclear raises a, a, a very considerable question because although there's no carbon emitted, the capital costs in advance of building these tremendous plants really raise issues. Uh, but we've learned that the classic alternative and renewable energy, particularly solar and wind, can be developed so quickly and have dropped so dramatically in price 
that it could, I think, quite rapidly be an alternative to the fossil fuel system. So I'm not as, I, I think the, the, the ethanol and biofuel stuff has gradually diminished in the public domain. As to, uh, I, I, I was sitting beside the premier of uh, Prince Edward Island. I mean, he's going to be premier for a few days longer. And, um, and I was sitting beside him and I was thinking, can I send him rays? Can I penetrate? Can I, can I penetrate his mind and just say, abortion, abortion, abortion? Just get him to realize that it is, it is absolutely unacceptable to have a province where you cannot have legal and legitimate abortions. It just is ingratiate myself with the audience. I, we actually, my family actually has a little cottage in, in Prince Edward Island. You didn't know I was an islander, did you? Uh, but uh, we have a, a, have a cottage in Bedeck uh, in, uh, in uh, Shelton. And, and, uh, and we're therefore familiar with some of the heroic and principled efforts on the part of many women in Prince Edward Island to, uh, to get legal abortions on the table. And they have not yet been successful, but they're working at it. I would think it would be a wonderful thing for the premier as his legacy on the day he departs to announce a reversal of policy. Damn it, I should have told him that when I was sitting beside him. It would be, it would be such a lovely thing if Giz said, okay, I'm changing this. This is a, this is a, a monstrous deficiency in Prince Edward Island. I'm going to change that. So I'm completely with you. There's, there's no question. Thank you for the question. But I think it's wrong, and I, you know, I think it's it's a fight worth waging because these things usually change. You'll get it; it'll come in time. It's very aggravating; it takes so long, but you'll 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 get it in time. And then the Aboriginal question. You know, again, I wouldn't want to prejudge the outcome of, of an inquiry, but I think what these inquiries tend to show is is the pattern of neglect which led us to this point and therefore can make recommendations on how differently to handle this kind of systemic murdering and sexual violence. It also usually gives a voice to the families and sometimes to, to the victims' voices prior to their disappearance. It, it, gives, it, it gives the public a sense of, of real people and who we're dealing with. It's kind of like uh, Renelle Harper, the enormous courage of her parents and of that young woman in coming forward and, and making Canadians understand we're dealing with a lovely, human, decent person here. This isn't some abstraction. Um, I, I think that these commissions are very good to give a you know, human face to the problem of identifying where it went wrong, and sometimes, if it's a particular good com good com particularly good commission, I'm so tired I can't speak anymore. A particularly good commission, they will identify where you might lay criminal charges. That can also come out of a of a good commission. So you know, again. Every single Aboriginal group in the country has asked for it. Why do you defy them? Why do you make mock of Canada's first citizens? And by the way, the fastest growing community in the country. Why do you do that? Uh, for me, uh, you know, there's only one explanation, and I voiced it this afternoon. Let me thank Mr. Lewis, uh, Stephen, um, you've given us amply of your time, although I'm sure we've all delivered a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, science lecture. You called it uh, a socialist perspective on the state of our confederation. But I have to say, I felt it to be a deeply Canadian perspective on uh, the state of our confederation. There was not one thing. <laughs>